Good morning, good afternoon, depending on the country you're in. Uh, I welcome you to the webinar cycles on gender perspective and science, technology, and innovation. This is being organized in the framework of Procesur. For those of you who do not know, this is a cooperative program for technological development in agribusiness in the Southern Cone, which was created in the 80, the year 1980, with the support of the IDB. And it encompasses all of the research institutes for the Southern Cone, Argentina, Brazil, Paraguay, and Uruguay, and AICA. The program has been adapted to the strategies and the changes that have occurred globally and regionally on social, economic, science, and technology realms. And we've incorporated the gender perspective in the year 2021, we made the decision as a consequence of giving visibility about the fact that certain indicators on gender parity in the region were falling behind. And in fact, they had uh, regressed a little bit after the pandemic. A few years ago, the member institutions and AICA have been making efforts to respond to the gender gap in the labor field and also in particular in the field of women in country realms and in a lesser way also in tackling the gender perspective in science and technology strategic planning and research projects so agencies have been working really hard by trying to give visibility, transforming policy frameworks, both for organizations and the countries, and also creating uh, strategies to develop awareness and to provide training. But despite this, we know that we made a lot of way, but there's a long road ahead of us, especially eliminating biases in agencies and research institutes. And there's still a long road between what we say and what we put into practice. So as part of this process, developing this regional agenda, we have identified that there's a very big need to understand the gender agenda fully and the gaps that exist and the impact of this biased work in research and also agricultural practices. There is evidence with regards to the improvements and the greater impact that can be had in scientific research and innovation by including diverse perspectives, including gender perspective. So we developed this regional agenda with the aim of strengthening the efforts that agencies have already been carrying out at the country level to strengthen the reduction of the gender gap, to understand them well, and to follow the pathways to reduce them, also in the realm of scientific research and development. At the end of our presentation by our keynote speaker, we will have a brief presentation of what we've been doing by some of the agencies that are involved in this today. This is the first webinar of this cycle, as I mentioned. The title is to integrate the gender perspective in scientific research and technological development projects in the region. We have the privilege to have Professor Landa Schinberg as our keynote speaker. She directs the Gender Innovation Project. We thank her very much for her availability, for sharing her perspectives and experiences on this topic, which is key for us, the impact on research. And now I will... Uh, give the floor to Mariana Steganini, who's the specialist on gender topics and who has been supporting the agenda since the beginning. So thank you very much. Welcome, everyone. We're certain that this will be a great presentation that will give us food for thought to start creating more deeper changes. Thank you. Mariana, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Cecilia. Thank you very much to all of the people connected here today. Before we start, I wanted to remind you two technical aspects. First of all, the people who registered, who are connected via Zoom, 
This conference has simultaneous interpretation into Portuguese and Spanish. So simply click down below to the right on the little planet icon that says interpretation and select your preferred language. I also wanted to let you know that we're broadcasting on the Procesur YouTube channel, both through Zoom and the YouTube channel. We ask you to introduce yourselves, let us know where are you connecting from. This event, its scope really exceeded the Southern Cone because we have people now from all of Latin America, but even beyond. I also wanted to ask you that in the chat, both here and on YouTube, place your questions for the professor so that in a few minutes you can engage with her. In this webinar, we have participants from the countries of Procesur, Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Paraguay, and Uruguay, of course, aside from AICA, the Inter-American Institute for Agricultural Cooperation in Costa Rica, but we also have participants from other countries in Latin America and the Caribbean, Mexico, Colombia, Guatemala, Ecuador, Honduras, Peru, Bolivia. Today, we're joined by agricultural um, institutes and also secretariats, ministries of science and agriculture. Among them, we have researchers, staff from the HR areas, specialists in technical cooperation, and also people who are part of the gender areas or gender sectors of these agencies. We also have professors, we have technical assistance professors and administration professors. While the audience is mostly audience devoted to research, the diverse range of activities and positions of people who have enrolled reveal that there is a genuine interest that is highly diverse on the topic at hand in this webinar. I now introduce Dr. Londa Schibinger, who's a professor of um, the history of science for the Department of History of Stanford University and the director of the Global Project of Gender Innovations in science, health and medicine, engineering and the environment. Between the year 20, 2004 and 2010, she was the director of the Clement Institute for Gender Research at Stanford. She's a member of the US uh, Academy of Art and Sciences. Uh, Professor Schibinger uh, obtained her PhD at Harvard in 1984 and is an international leading authority on gender and science. For the past 30 years, her work has focused on resolving the gender puzzle in science through the history of the participation of women in science, the structure of scientific institutions, and the role of gender in human knowledge. Several of us here today have studied and learned based on her books and listening to her conferences. Professor Londa Schibinger, it's truly an honor and a privilege for Posisur to have you present here today for all years. Please go ahead, thank you. Thank you for that kind introduction. So today, I you can see my slides, yes? Yes, okay. Um, today I want to explore with you gendered innovations. I launched Gendered Innovations in 2009. The methods and materials have been produced through a large international collaboration involving the European Commission, the US National Science Foundation and Stanford University. And we've now expanded around the world, especially into South Africa, South Korea and Japan. Institutes for Gendered Innovation Research were opened in Korea in 2015 and in Japan in 2022. Gendered Innovations has brought together over 220 basic scientists, engineers, and gender experts in a series of collaborative workshops. New policies have been implemented across the European Union, Canada, and the US. And we also work with companies in Silicon Valley, industry leaders such as Apple, Google, and the like. So innovation 
is about integrating sex, gender, and intersectional analysis into the design of research. The operative question is, how can we harness the creative power of sex, gender, and intersectional analysis for discovery? Does this approach add valuable dimensions to research? Does it take research in new directions? So I'm very excited about your initiative for integrating gender perspectives as strategic opportunities in agricultural research institutes. And in my talk today, I will discuss a number of examples of how gender analysis enhances science and point to the methods that we have available on our Gendered Innovations website. And I'm sorry that I don't have strong examples in agriculture. I would very much invite a collaboration with your researchers to create a case study for agriculture on the Gendered Innovations website. We have one labeled agriculture, but it's really about uh, fishing. <laughs> Um, so I will be covering some of the methods and insights for embedding gender innovation into agricultural uh, innovations from that particular case study. So first, a bit of background. Let's get this right. Governments and universities in the US and Western Europe have taken three strategic approaches to gender equality over the past several decades. The first is fix the numbers which focuses on increasing the number of women and underrepresented groups in science. This is about participation. It's about creating gender balance in research teams. It's about hiring more women and underrepresented people at universities. And for agriculture, I might imagine that indigenous people may have insights to share and that research teams might profit from their engagement. So the second strategic approach is fix the institutions. This is pues arreglar las instituciones. Esto promueve la igualdad de género en carreras desde cambios estructurales en las organizaciones de investigación. Aquí se enfoca en hacer reformas universitarias y en los institutos de investigación para que las carreras de todos puedan florecer. Se ha hablado mucho de los cambios estructurales en Estados Unidos y en Europa y ha hallado esta publicación reciente de la Comisión Europea. Tal vez ya la tienen. Esto es vencer los retos de cambios estructurales en las investigaciones. En institution meets the new participants and they aren't fit into the old culture of the institution. And then in the U.S., we also find that dual career couples are an issue. In 2008, I led a national U.S. study um, with policy recommendations for universities, and both of these publications are freely available on the web. Now, the third strategic approach is fix the knowledge or gendered innovations, and this stimulates excellence in science and technology by integrating sex, gender, and intersectional analysis into research. So my short talk today will focus on this third strategic approach, fixing the knowledge. And for fixing the knowledge, I recommend our nature perspective as a good overview. So we distinguish these three fixes analytically, but in reality, they work together. Although many people try to fix the numbers first, we academics will not fix the numbers unless we also fix the knowledge. So let me give you two quick examples of the link between who does science and what science is created. So the first paper is about medical research. This is where a lot of research in gendered innovations was done uh, at the beginning. So using a sample of 1.5 million medical research papers, our study found a link between women's authorship and the likelihood of the study to include sex and gender analysis. Now, this should not be so. It should not be that women researchers do more sex and gender analysis because sex and gender analysis is about excellence in research. Everyone needs to be doing this kind of research, but nonetheless, this is what we found. So uh, researchers, so um, we find that, well, so, 
So I can't see your audience really here today. And I wonder if it's a majority of women, whenever we talk about gender, often our audiences are a majority of women. So we need to make sure that everyone has the skills to integrate sex and gender analysis into research, because as I said, it creates excellence in research. Now, in a second study done by Rem Koenig at Harvard's Business School, this study shows that if all biomedical patents filed between 1976 and 2010 had been produced equally by men and women, there would be some 6,500 more female-focused biomedical innovations. So here we see that the fact that women are left out of research, that there are barriers in the institutions, we see that we are not getting um, all the innovations that we could have. Now, why, why might all of this be relevant to your research? Why should you include sex, gender, and intersectional analysis in your research? Maybe you collaborate with European researchers. Beginning in 2020, and this is really important, the European Commission's Europe, uh, Horizon Europe strengthened their gender dimension in research. Applicants are now required to integrate sex, gender, and or intersectional analysis into the design of research or to justify that it's not relevant. Now, this type of research isn't always relevant. Take physics, black holes, you would not be analyzing gender in black holes um, in theoretical physics, but in almost all fields of science, sex, gender, and intersectional uh, analysis are relevant. So the European Commission requires it if you want public funding. So the idea is, and this is important, the idea is that if taxpayer money is to be used, research should benefit all people across the whole of society. So I don't know if uh, your research organizations in the Southern Cone have such policies. To provide the intellectual foundations for the European Commission's policy, the EC held a two-year expert group, which I directed. This group consisted of 25 experts from numerous fields of science, from biomedicine, marine science, to machine learning and environmental sciences, and our results are published here. This book is easy to find and downloadable. It's free, and many of the um, many of the case studies are on our website. Okay, now that I've set the stage, let's dive into some of the sex, gender, and intersectional analysis in research. I see your group is interested in the fourth industrial revolution. That is to say, the digital revolution. So I take my examples from AI and machine learning. So this is to show how this kind of analysis can bring innovation. So take search engines. If we look at Google search, and let's say you're searching for jobs, in the search results that appear, men are five times more likely than women to be offered ads for high paying jobs. So why is that? It has to do with the data and the search algorithm. So men in the US on average, all men, not broken down by ethnicity or uh, where they live or educational background, all men on average are paid 20% more than women in the US still, I have to say. We've been working on this forever. So this is, as I said, it's an average of all men and all women. The algorithm here has been designed to get the ad to the right person. In this case, an ad for a high paying job would go to a man, but we see that this perpetuates the cycle of social inequalities. Now, once the Google engineers became aware of the problem, they went about fixing it. Now, a second issue, and this is in um, health science. So we have, um, so this is health technology. So we see that soap dispensers don't work for people with darker skin. There's a very funny video on the internet that shows a man with white hands putting his hand under the soap dispenser and he gets soap. And a man with darker hands puts his hands under the soap dispenser and does not get any soap. White hands soap, darker hands no soap. 
Um, and now why is that? Again, it has to do with the technology, the near infrared technology to see the hand close the circuit and dispense the soap does not work for darker skin. Now, more seriously, we found during the pandemic that pulse oximeters, which have the same technology, don't work for darker skinned people. And the pulse oximeter, which measures the oxygen level in your blood, is the first line of defense in the emergency rooms when you come in with COVID. So this put people with dar darker skin at risk for serious conditions. Um, and if you aren't getting supplemental oxygen when you need it, you can have organ failure. Now, another example, one of my favorites, in compute, and this is computer vision. Computer vision is uh, the technology that when you type in the word cat, you get pictures of a cat. It's very simple, computer vision. So here we see a photograph of a traditional US bride dressed in white over here. And this image is correctly labeled bride, dress, woman, wedding. So if you put in those words, bride, dress, woman, wedding, you would get a picture like this. But the photograph of this beautiful North Indian bride is mislabeled in the database as performance art, red, costume. So if you put in the word bride, you would not get this beautiful bride. So why is this? Again, it has to do with the data. The computer vision, um, so ImageNet is a, a huge data set with 14 million labeled images, and it runs a lot of our computer vision. And in this data set, we discovered that 45% of the data comes from the US, even though we're only 4% of the world's population. So we are represented 10 times over. But if you take China and India together, in this data set, they only represent 3% of the images here, even though these countries represent 36% of the world's population. So we need data sets that are appropriate for geodiversity. Now, each of these examples is important. Sorry, each of these examples is important, but what did you notice about each one? Each example focuses on only one social dimension in isolation, either gender with Google search or skin tone with the soap dispensers. Um, and here we want to focus on a higher level problem and that's what we call intersectionality. So what is intersectionality and what is an intersectional approach? So intersectionality describes overlapping and intersecting forms of discrimination related to gender, to disabilities, to ethnicity, sexuality, the list can go on, socioeconomic status, geographic location. The term was coined in 1989 by legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw to describe how multiple forms of discrimination intersect specifically for her in black women's lives. In 1989, her concern was that the white feminist movement was excluding women of color. Now, let me show you how this works in research on facial recognition. Now, facial recognition, you know, um, you open your phone and if it's a, you know, a, a smartphone, it can open by just seeing your face or your computer might open by just seeing your face. This is facial recognition. So this work was done by Joe Joy Bolimwini and is called Gender Shades. So um, Gender Shades studies intersectionality, specifically how gender and race intersect, and showed that facial recognition could not see Black women's faces. Now, interesting, Joy Bolimwini was the researcher doing this work, and her own program could not see her face, so she became very interested in this research. So here we have the gender analysis. This is one dimension. Systems perform better on men's faces than women's faces in facial recognition. Then we have another dimension, race analysis. So systems perform better on lighter skin than darker skin overall. But then when we do an intersectional analysis, 
we see that the, the system performed worse for black women. The error rate was 35% for darker skinned women. So one third of the time, the program could not see women with darker skin. The performance was a bit better with a 12% error rate for darker skinned men, 7% error rate for lighter skinned women, and less than 1% for lighter skinned men because they were the ones who developed the program and used themselves as the example. So they trained it on their own lighter skin. But there's more for facial recognition. Um, sexuality analysis shows that systems may not recognize transgender faces, faces, especially during transition periods. And we can do one more gender analysis. If you are wearing makeup, facial cosmetics can reduce the accuracy of facial recognition up to 76%. And this is important because a lot of the international borders now use facial recognition for you to pass in and out of countries. So make sure you wear the same makeup you did in your passport photo. So here we have the intersectional innovation. So I want to go into this innovation some. So Bulamwini and Gebru, who did this, who found this bias, created a more inclusive data set to fix the problem. And they included the faces from men and women with lighter and darker skin, they chose members of parliament from six countries because members of parliament are public faces and can be shown. So they had three uh, from Africa and three from Europe. But what problem do you see in this more inclusive data set? So my students saw it immediately. There are no Asians or indigenous people from the Americas or from Australia. And we don't know if any non-binary people are imaged. So we still need innovations to make such technologies work for everyone, but this particular innovation increased the accuracy hugely and many companies adopted uh, Bulamwini's new data set. Now, let me add facial recognition is really a problem. Uh, getting the data right and making technology see everyone is one aspect of the problem of facial recognition, but there are larger issues of security. Transgender people, for example, may not want to be tracked by facial recognition systems at all. And the potential misuse of facial recognition has led to several actions. Belgium, for example, has declared the use of facial recognition illegal across the country. France and Sweden have banned its use in schools and the city of San Francisco has banned its use by public authorities. And this is mostly because it misidentifies people with darker skin. And so the police are often identifying a criminal as a, you know, a man with darker skin and it turns out the system was just wrong. So this is why we have some of these bans. Now we at Gendered Innovation released a tool for intersectionality, and this is our intersectional design cards. So I'm happy to say that our cards won a prize in the UK last year, um, and we defined 12 factors. So the cards are for research teams as they start their work. They're really kind of for product designers, but can be used for anyone. And we defined these 12 factors thinking that they're the basic factors that people need to take into consideration for innovation and discovery. These are factors that have often been left out. People who are not designed for or uh, are left out of research. So this includes age, disabilities, educational background, ethnicity, family configuration. Is it a single uh, head of household, single woman head of household? What is the family like? Um, and these other uh, factors. Now, Apple, also released its intersectional list of factors. And they went for many more than we did. Some of these, I think would be hard to know what are people's philosophical beliefs, um, you know? But anyway, these are important. These, this is what they design around. So if you have an iPhone, it's been designed around these factors. I find some of these very interesting like handedness. Um, uh, my neighbor, so the Stanford faculty live on campus and my neighbor happens to be a world-class uh, hand surgeon. 
but she is left-handed and surgical instruments have made, been made for right-handed people. So just think how much more amazing she might be if the instruments had met her needs rather than she, the surgeon, having to meet the needs of these right-handed instruments. And we also know when we have robots, uh, they'll be doing handover tasks, which re will require the technology to understand handedness. Now, both of these sets of factors were developed in a US context. So Europeans tell me all the time that they can't include race, for example. Um, after World War II, European governments stopped collecting data by race because of the Nazi uh, regimes, but there's still racism in the society. So I would think they need to consider it. And also we all do research for a global audience. So we need to understand these factors globally. So that's the first point. These factors will be by culture and you need to choose the factors that are relevant for the Southern Cone, for your particular societies. A second point to make is that each research, research team needs to choose the factors most relevant to their research. You can't consider all of these factors. These are things you might think about as you begin, and then uh, through your preliminary research, you cut it down to the most important things, like maybe gender, maybe, uh, I don't know, disabilities, maybe uh, geographic location, whatever it might be. But you, you obviously can't do all the factors. You need to choose what to focus on, but you should not rely on an unconscious default when you're choosing factors. You need to make conscious decisions. Okay, now I'm moving on to another example. This is close to my last example here. And this is climate change. And my example comes from marine science. So, so far I've focused on humans, but we need to also focus on uh, marine organisms. So I, I recently had a Marie Curie postdoc from the European Commission working with me at Stanford Marines Station. And we've just published a review of sex analysis in marine organisms. Now, marine organisms, you know, we think of male and female, um, non-binary, intersex, but marine organisms are really interesting. I even left male and female off the list, but they have all of these types of sex. Simultaneous hermaphrodites, sequential hermaphrodites, uh, proandric hermaphrodites, they start as male and then switch to female and so on and so forth. So very interesting evolutionarily. I think it, it, it outshines humans here, I think. So now I have to say that in English, we use the term intersex for humans, whereas for plants and animals, we still use the term hermaphrodite, just to make that clear for non-native uh, speakers of English. Now, global warming is hurting marine organisms. And this is a concern for all of us today. It means that our fisheries are in trouble. And importantly, whether we're talking here about fish, or mollusks or crustaceans or any of the marine organisms, it's important to know that only 4% of the studies of these creatures have looked at sex, have analyzed sex. So there's really, a, we, this is a missed opportunity. There's much more we can do in this realm. So why is this important? For species reliant on temperature for sex determination, such as turtles, Rapid global warming poses a risk to sex ratios and stability of populations. As you probably know, the sex of a turtle, you learned this in grade school, the sex of a turtle depends on the temperature. If the climate is warmer, you get a female, and if the climate is cooler, you get a male. An important study found that turtle sex ratio responds dramatically to global warming. So in Australia, the study was in Australia, and they found that turtles born in the warmer part of the Great Barrier Reef became 99% female. This is not right. While in the cooler parts of the Great Barrier Reef, the sex ratio of turtles remained a more natural 68% female. 
such changes in sex balance can lead to population collapse. If the population is 99% female, it's hard for it to reproduce. So we could do many, many of these examples um, for marine organisms. The major point is that analyzing sex-based responses to climate change enables better modeling of demographic change among marine organisms and downstream impacts on humans. Effective ocean management and mitigation of climate change impacts depends on understanding organism and ecosystem responses to anthropogenic and environmental change. And then I just want to add, we've just started a new method for um, environmental work. And that is that we want to make this all intersectional by looking at how humans impact oceans and how uh, then we eat the fish and how oceans uh, bring us food insecurity when populations collapse. So we wanna look at a more holistic, um, and I would say intersectional um, analysis for environmental uh, work. So anyway, there's a case study for that under sustainable fashion that you can look at. So designing sex and gender analysis into research is one crucial component contributing to world-class science and technology. Now, what I want to do is to go to the website quickly and show you um, some of the resources we have here for integrating sex, gender, and intersectional analysis um, in, in your research. So we have lots of methods. And one you will for sure want to look at is analyzing gender. And importantly, analyzing gender is just not one thing you do. It's not that you just use the same number of male and female mice or uh, humans in your research study. It, you have to look at it through the entire research cycle. So when you're identifying the problem, what are the gender issues that have led you to a priority in your research? And we have some of the uh, latest research here to help guide you with that. Then when you're designing the research, what are the gender aspects you need to consider? And again, we have the, all the major points here. Well, not all of them, but some. And then the literature is down here that you can see. Then collecting data for gender equality. What do you need to consider when analyzing the data? What do you need to do? So it goes through the whole research process. We do that as well for sex. Um, and you see that it's our, our basic approach to insist that analyzing sex enhances all phases of the research. Now, I wanted to go, we do have one um, case study. We've labeled it agriculture because we really wanted to do one on agriculture, but really our example here is gillnets fishing in Bangladesh. But I think some of the points might be useful to you in your research as you try to integrate sex and gender analysis into agricultural research. So gender transformative approaches have been developed to address issues by fostering the critical examination of gender roles, gender norms, and gender relations um, in, say, agricultural research. And then recognizing the strength um, and positive no norms that support equality. So you can look at these. And then I don't know if you know the project Genovate, but they have uh, three more points that might be relevant to your research. Now, um, if I may, I want to just uh, look for one second at policy recommendations because I heard that some people in your audience are at agencies um, and doing policy work or at universities. So to really integrate gendered innovations, so gender perspectives into research, we need the science infrastructure to be supporting this. And there are three pillars of um, support for science and innovation. So funding agencies are very important. And I've already talked a little bit about those. Um, 
funding agencies need to ask that sex, gender, and maybe intersectional analysis be included in the proposals before public funds are awarded to a project. We want to make sure that a research project benefits everyone across all of society. Peer-reviewed journals are really doing their part. They are now looking, they've adopted something called the Sager guidelines, and they've adopted sex and gender um, guidelines so that an, a manuscript is not considered excellent unless it answers the gender questions it must answer. So if you want to publish in some of the big name journals like Nature or Lance, The Lancet or Cell, some of these big journals, uh, you, you need to do that. And then universities, we are really not doing our job. I can say that I'm a university professor. We need to integrate sex and gender analysis throughout the curriculum so that students learn how to do it when they learn their other technical skills at university. And then for the funding agencies, I just want to show you if one of your funding agencies in the Southern Cone wants to implement uh, sex and gender analysis uh, in their proposals in throughout their agency, we have a five part plan um, that shows you how you might do that. So it's a policy roadmap. You click into each of these and you get the best practices uh, for each of these particular um, aspects. So with that, I'm going to end my remarks and I'm very happy to answer questions and to discuss with you um, any part of this that you would like to discuss. Londa, muchísimas gracias por tan Londa, thank you very much for your very generous presentation, so detailed. There are a few questions, but as a starting point, in relation to the very last thing you were explaining, could you tell us a little bit more about how the processes for the integration of this analysis work, these methods, how are they made operational? Is it the collective of researchers that work specifically on this? They work on these guides that you mentioned. How do you make this operational? Because for us in our region, this is highly innovative. Okay, so you, you're talking about researchers, right? not funding agencies. Okay, researchers. Okay. Well, this is exactly what we were doing with gendered innovations was trying to make this operational. So I think you first have to start with the terms. What do, so, you know, this is stuff people have to study. <laughs> it's, it's not, it's like any kind of research. It has, it, it's, um, a lifetime's work. It's something, as I say, it should be taught in undergraduate and graduate work at universities so that people know these things. Okay, so I think we start with gender. And so the definitions are important. So first we have to think about what are the gender norms? Um, gender norms are those pressures in society, those spoken and unspoken rules that make men and women do what they do. We all conform to gender roles. We do what is expected of us as men or women. And this is where you find gender inequality, right? So these gender norms can be in the workplace. They can be in the family culture. Like what did your parents expect you to be when you grew up, right? It can be in the institutional policy in state, national culture, any of these things. Um, let's see, how do I get back now? <laughs> I have to get back. Oof. Sorry. Okay. And then, um, then if we look, so that's the one, the second one is gender identity. This is then how people identify themselves. They might be, you know, masculine, feminine, non-binary, whatever that is. And this is when we press out against the gender norms and change society. 
And then there's gender relations. And this is the power relations between different genders. And this is how society works. So whenever you walk into a room, you do this quite unconsciously. You look at who is in the room and you size up what is the power dynamic here. When may I speak? When do I have to be quiet? When do I have to agree? When can I state my opinion? That sort of thing. So we have to be clear what the terms are. And this is what the definitions are about. Then we have the methods, and this is where we try to operationalize things. So first we have the method of rethinking research priorities and outcomes. This, and you can click in here and you can get, you know, you can get this text of, of what we're thinking when we're doing that. Um, so we have, and this goes through the research process first, how are you setting your research project? What are the priorities? What are the gender considerations there? What are the environmental considerations? What are the social considerations? Then rethinking concepts and theories. Um, concepts are interesting because some of them immediately exclude men or women. If we take the concept of osteoporosis, which is the disease that thins your bones as you get older and then you might fall and break your hip. That concept leaves out men because osteoporosis is considered a female disease. So you have to think when you're using a concept, who does it privilege in society and who does it not privilege? And then we have formulating research questions, analyzing sex. I showed you the five part uh, method where you would read all those articles and learn what that has to say, then analyzing gender, uh, then analyzing how sex and gender interact. This is really important. They aren't individual things, but they interact. If we think about humans, um, so humans are formed by society, but they're also formed by their physiology, by their genes and their sex hormones. And these interact to make us who we are as adults. Um, and this is about lab research. So there's just a lot you need to do. And, you know, it's, it's something that you have to learn. There's not just a formula. It's particular, as researchers, you know that it, the methods are particular to your field and your questions. And so you have to learn this stuff about gender so that you can apply it um, to your research project. And it's not just one thing. I wish it were simple, but it's really very exciting. <laughs> and um, I've spent my whole life doing it and also developing methodologies for it. So it, it's not, you know, you need workshops. So my suggestion to you is that you have some workshops where I do these, but surely you have experts who can do this, who talk about what gender research is. Uh, so this would be about an hour and a half workshop. We talk about and give examples of how gender improves a research project. And then the researchers for, form groups where they will talk about how any of this uh, relates to their research. And then after coffee break, everyone comes back and the the groups report out in a plenary session of what they discovered or how our new insight they have because they took sex and gender into account. So they haven't done the research yet, but they imagine it's a new question. And these groups will then compete with each other to have the best answer. And I think people begin to see, they feel, they understand a bit more. So you're going to have to have some workshops. Um, you know, you're going to have to People have to study this. Gracias, Lona. En a lo Thanks, que... Lona. In relation to your last example, it is evident in the medicine area environment. So uh, that clearly affects the health of women. This is pretty well expressed in some study cases, but in relation to agriculture, uh, some people uh, in YouTube ask uh, if there are technological development beyond the two cases you have commented about the uh, uh, nets in Bangladesh. If there are 
some technological development that has impacted positively in the implementation of gender approach in agriculture. Yeah, so I'm sorry, I have not studied that field. So um, this is what I would invite your group to work with us here at Gendered Innovations to find several really good examples that are eye-opening for people that really show what a difference this makes. And there's another question. We have commented this in the gender working group. What is their role? In your experience, what is the role of institutions? The progress condition about the treatment of gender topics in institutions, the three dimensions go in parallel. We understand that, but the experience in institutions that have progressed in approaching the topic, in training, raising awareness, uh, uh, regulations, how much of this uh, uh, has an incidence uh, 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 regarding the gender perspective and to the design of projects and programs. Yes, so um, we have a really new important development in the United States, and this has to do with artificial intelligence, which is, so I'm gonna use that as an example. You would need to do it for agriculture, but let me tell you about this. So artificial intelligence is very dangerous, right? And the people who develop these technologies don't pay attention to the social impact. So the computer science departments at Harvard University and Stanford University and other places, I know a university in Germany, in Munich, have done this. What they do is that they bring in, the professors have decided that it is important to teach collaboratively with a social scientist. So they teach the technical skills for developing algorithms, and they teach at the same time the social impacts that these algorithms might have. So the computer science professor couldn't do it alone. That professor needed the help of a social scientist, so they've changed their teaching model to be these two types of professors teaching together. And not only that, our National Academy of Engineering, so I imagine you have a National Academy of Agricultural Research. So our National Academy of Engineering said, yes, this is extremely important. So at the highest level of research, they're saying, yes, we must look at the social impact at the same time that we develop the technical skills. So this would be the type of thing you might develop for agriculture to teach students how to consider gender issues at the same time that they're learning about soils and that they're learning about you know irrigation and and these sorts of things so um that really is the kind of program you need to implement now we also i want to say in the us we also have something called gender studies it's a separate program and they teach all gender stuff, but not related to any of the sciences. So that's kind of helpful, but not as helpful as actually getting into the agricultural sciences and teaching from inside. We have discussed several times a training plan that we held last year for almost 60 uh, gender managers from institutes about some things related to uh, agricultural machinery design projects. Uh, this is designed to be managed by a man, to be dried by a man because of the size and the weight. So one example of one of the countries of the region, uh, being was developed with many nutritional benefits. It was a two years of research project, thinking that that could be a contribution for the most vulnerable sectors in population. But in practice, this was not adopted because it took a double of the time to cook. 
So they did not consider the situation of women the take care of these tasks and the use of their time and the care task. The rurality environment is the really masculine and the care tasks in rural areas are even um, greater compared to what happens in the urban environment. There's a lot of things to work there. Uh, as we understand in our working group, we believe there are many things to do to understand this, not only for the research projects, uh, biologic ones, but also uh, rural development projects. Uh, there, are, there are many things to do. We hope we could uh, progress together in some of these projects or ideas. But there's no question this idea of workshops is really valuable and we will accept it. Uh, Landa, uh, and the chat, uh, uh, people talk about the gender gaps in university registration in the areas of science and technology and the stereotypes, uh, how to overcome the influence of family in women when uh, selecting the uh, career. Paraguay is asking this. There is a generation matter here, and it also implies, has an implication, it implies a, a registration gap because those are the best paid careers. And there is also a possible uh, going back uh, in the equality acquired because these careers are uh, very important in the agricultural sector for the future. Any reflection about this, Londa, from you? Well, this is the uh, structural change booklet that I was showing you, right? Getting rid of the stereotypes. And so um, I used to study all that stuff, but I've now just focused on the knowledge because that's the piece that needed more work on it. Um, but as you said, these all work together, right? So the machinery, you gave the wonderful example of the machinery that is too big and heavy and whatever for, for women to use easily. This is, it was based on stereotypes and it reinforces stereotypes. So we have to see these reinforcing mechanisms all the time. Yeah, I think we've done a lot. So I like your example of the agricultural machinery, for instance, because that's really easy to fix. People understand this problem. Like, because with car design, we've been working on it forever with car design. So it would just be, you know, machinery. So that could be, uh, you know, something, an easy kind of win for you. Um, but so, I mean, you know, all of this implies a huge process of social change, <laughs> which to support any of this. So you, I, I really think that the best approach is university courses that study this. So in the gender studies programs at universities, do you have gender studies in your universities? Programs that just focus on gender studies across all fields, literature and art and history and so on. I cannot generalize because we are several countries here, but it is not the most, fre most frequent, the cross-cutting this, uh, look, uh, we have vertical or isolated cuts. It is not frequent. I see. This is one of the comments we were about to make because this happens. So it is not common. We need the training for professionals uh, related to gender, in relation to gender. They, are no, they do not have tools for that. Yeah, so I think there are really two things here. There are the general gender studies courses that, you know, that it's for literature and art and history and engineering and agriculture. It's for any field, but they're the people who talk about stereotypes and who talk about the big social change that needs to go on. So that's one aspect is universities would do very well to have gender studies programs. So you have professors who are experts in that, who teach these things. And then the second piece is what I was describing about uh, the computer science in the US, which you could do with agricultural sciences, bringing together the technical person and the 
gender expert to teach together. So that's really two different approaches, but I think both are needed. Because if you have the gender studies, it increases the knowledge of how gender works in a society for all college graduates. You could do it in high school. You know, it would be for, for everyone who graduates. Perfect, really clear. And last, Londa, we know you have a committed agenda, but this is a question related to funding matters that you mentioned. To better understand or to understand this, many of the institutes in developing their projects, we are clearly seeing that one of the requirements to get funding is to include the gender perspective. But the situation is that this requirement is enough in order to really integrate this uh, gender dimension. Because uh, just by saying this number of women participated, uh, it's like this is enough to say that their project has a gender perspective. There's another dimension. Is there any other dimension? Could we elaborate a little bit in terms of uh, funding requirements? And what is it that we can request or can we show more to prove this? Okay, so I really recommend that you look at, for, for funding, um, I really recommend that you look at this uh, policy framework. So um, if you want to have, a so we did a paper, where's our paper? Uh, we did a paper in science. Um, hmm. Uh, it's here, you can see it here. So I went to policy major funding agencies. So we have a science paper here, but this is an elaboration of what funding agencies need to do. So they want to have, they want to ask about gender in proposals. They can't just ask that question. They first have to define the terms. And then we have all the definitions, the best practices from funding agencies around the world in definitions of terms like defining gender. Then we have proposals for guidelines for applicants. So they need instructions. Are you going to encourage this or require this? You give examples, but you can click in here and see them all. Then there's instructions for evaluators. This is usually the problem. You ask for gender in your proposal, but the evaluators have not been trained at university to know what that means. So this is instructions for evaluators and then Here's the training for applicants, evaluators, and the funder staff. And then, of course, every funder needs to evaluate their policy implementation. We find this is the weakest part that people have. So you can learn a lot about how a funder would do this by going through. So, for instance, training, uh, each one of these you can click and find, you know, so the European Commission has tr two trainings. These are booklets. Uh, the German uh, Science Foundation has a few little trainings here. NSERC in Canada has trainings. So you can see what is available here and use those. But for agriculture, you would have to develop trainings yourself because that is new territory. I'm telling you, we really need this. So I'm very anxious to work with you to find something very cool. We don't have many, gendered innovations doesn't have many connections in Latin America. And I would like to have more because it's important. Thank you so much, Landa. We are receiving uh, encouraging comments, uh, interesting comments, a uh, revealing training, very good uh, consequences of this uh, generous conversation we have had with you. The truth is that there is a lot to do. This is a clear conclusion. Everything is to be done. So we hope we can uh, go this way together. From Procesur, there is a belief that co international cooperation is key in order to strengthen these strategies and particularly to give them sustainability. So we are in this way, 
and we hope to continue or to start uh, going this way together with Projects Londa and to everybody that are working that are working in this area. We thank you particularly the participation and the commitment with this. Well, we do not have more questions. Uh, uh, we only have comments. So, Londa, we invite you to stay. I, ca I cannot. <laughs> Then we will share the page of Gender Innovations, the link to the video of this webinar for you to be able to check and continue sharing the information, which is a lot of information. So really, thank you so much. It has been an honor for us. Now, I don't know if you want to add something. We're go I'm going to take uh, some minutes. Just from Processor Londa Wiki, we have your context. Some countries have expressed interest in, in being inserted in the status where they stand for. So we will make the corresponding contacts in the future. Thank you so much. Great Thank presentation, you. really clear presentation. Bye bye. Bye bye. Gracias, Londa. Bueno, me quedo. Um... Esto, perdón, Mariana, solo, solo comento porque vi ahí un, un mensaje de Agrosavia y demás. Después vemos, en todo caso, cómo seguir canalizando eh, algunas de las inquietudes. Claramente desde Procesur vamos a intentar continuar con esta agenda con la Universidad de Stanford, que creo que lo, lo positivo que nos mostró Londa es que existen herramientas para mejorar esto, que hay una, un claro in the agricultural sector. The sector is really a male sector, so it is more than important to start seeing how uh, we can work and what tools we can even contribute to improve the materials generated by the Stanford University. So we could channel all this. I just wanted to comment this. We are reading comments and we're gonna find a way to give continuity to the matter. Thank you, Cecilia. And in line with this, we'll take a couple of minutes of this space to share with you. Many of you know this because you are part of the Processor Working Group, but not everybody. So other institutes uh, that are here, we want to share with you a brief uh, overview of uh, our history, the things we are working on and the things we have in our portfolio to release very soon and to share with you. Procisur has a working group of gender in science, innovation, and technology institutions, as well as research. In 2021, uh, we started as a group, so gender reference people from uh, uh, INIA and ICA that are part of process who got together to state what working joint working agenda could be generated, and there there we create this working group that aims to strengthen the agendas of the institutes that were already working in this, but also to uh, address uh, strongly these attempts to institutionalize the gender perspective by integrating this gender dimension from the zero time of their project, something common that occurs with a generalized level, an important percentage was uh, to state that just by getting a number of meetings, participating on a meeting or on a training was enough. So we had this idea. So we progressed and we developed a basic document Landa mentioned today. She knows about that. This document is available in Procesur webpage where we you can feel the position of this working group and the cooperation regarding this uh, thematic for this southern cone. So from this, one of the main uh, assessments was that, that we clearly needed more people trained in gender 
and the strategic implication with gender approach and the implication of including the gender approach. We provided a three month training last year. It was a close training to INIA and AICA where we really strengthen this idea of strategic planning and integration of this dimension, having an assessment of other things related to gender gaps uh, from structural violence uh, up to stereotypes, uh, women access to scientific positions, uh, to leadership positions, but uh, it was very clear, uh, some things uh, uh, were very clear. And with that, we develop a roadmap related to gender matters for this space. And this year, March 2023, the steering committee of procedure approved four thematic working lines that were implemented after the approval. One of those is related to strengthening this space. A publication is about to be released. Publication from Procesur on gender, institutions of science, technology, and innovation in the region. We are also concluding to develop a web page within the space of Procesur, specifically for gender matters. The second working line is consider so we are in the instance of uh, uh, taking information we have worked with a group of each inia and aica in developing dimensions and definition of indicators common indicators to the institute it is a whole challenge because there is a lot of diversity in countries and institutions and there we could uh, choose some common elements that will help let us to measure year by year and to see how we are doing in relation to some matters and to reduce the gender gaps and to be able to measure and submit and to trace agendas and to give continuity to institutional agendas linked to the gender matters in the INEAP of Southern Cone. It is a big challenge because we are creating a new tool with a particular approach, which are the Institutes of Science and Technology, Agricultural Science and Technology Institute. So we are excited in the working group with the project. And we are on uh, taking information to submit the first and incipient results before the end of the year. On the other hand, we are working in organizing a line about what well, we talked to Londa. I mean, no engineer, female engineer or veterinarian or economist uh, need to know how to integrate the gender perspective. Even knowing about gender, even having a great will, it is complex, it is not in the basic training. So we're working on a method, simple methodological guidance, step-by-step step, that helps to integrate this gender dimension in the data collection and design execution uh, evaluation projects to make a big leap to this idea that only with a team having 50% of women were doing okay. Or if we have half and half and those uh, people training were doing well. So it does not clearly mean that we are reducing the gaps or that we are not reproducing some stereotypes. So we're working in this as well. And the fourth line is a raising awareness and training line. We believe in this scheme, there are many things to, uh, missing. Uh, there are many things to say and to do. And uh, there is many. there are many things to discuss and to include in a dialogue, conversation, and debate about these gender matters, specifically related to science, technology, and innovation in the region, particularly in the agricultural sector. There are still many things to do and to discuss in order to build definitions, common definitions with a regional character. 
because there are many tools. Uh, Landa showed many from Stanford, and she also showed many from uh, hey, Europe Horizon. There are many tools in the world, but we firmly believe that we need to build a tools on our own, respecting the entities, diversity of our countries, and particularly the character and the importance of the agri-food and agro-industrial production in for the development of our nation. So we leave uh, the email of the executive secretary of Procesur, the webpage of Procesur. You will see soon in the gender working group section so we remain available for any uh, discussion. And of course, we want to thank your participation, both uh, people working in the gender working group, as well as those who have joined this idea. I also want to thank Barbara, Daniel, uh, Helen for the interpretation and the whole technical IK team that has given us uh, a lot of support. The document in the page is within the uh, institutional strengthening lines. There you can find the document. One of the processors lines uh, includes the gender aspect and the basic document. And it is also good to say that we will continue with the cycle. That was the first webinar. So we're going to invite you soon uh, uh, information about the second one and the third one and working on the topics of uh, women leadership that uh, it means that women are having this uh, second position. So uh, this is interesting. We believe we need to represent this into the sector as well. I'm sorry because I have not commented this. 85% uh, uh, of people participating in this webinar are women. And this is something, as Landa said, we need more participation of uh, people uh, integrating institutions. There are uh, chauvinistic women, uh, and uh, female men. So we need them in this space to work and transform the reality of institutions internally and also in relation to the scientific and technologic production. Thank you so much. Thanks to everybody that have participated and asked questions. We will send you by email all these details that we commented today. Thank you so much. We hope we see you in the next webinar. Once we have the web, uh, we we'll hope we're gonna have more participation uh, of institutions from the region and some people that, that joined this webinar and they are new in the group. Thank you very much.